for the park. Okay, so I work here in Covent Garden. You probably know where it is in Place Rogier in Brussels. And this is the building where the Synergy grantees will come um, for interviews. So this is the only grant scheme in the ERC where the PIs actually will come physically uh, to attend the interviews. Um, just before going into the ERC grant schemes, a couple of words about myself. So I work at the ERC um, for the past 13 years. Uh, my background is in biophysics. I used to be a researcher and, and um, working at university. And um, then I joined the commission for a short stint. And then since 13 years, I, I work at the, um, at the ERC, both as a scientific officer, and I'm in charge of the, uh, of the Synergy grants um, since its conception, since 12, uh, 2012. Um, in this capacity, I'm advising um, you, the applicants, NCPs, giving presentation to NCPs, writing information for applicants, setting up the, the system for, in which you apply, um, setting up also the evaluation system itself, making sure that the procedures are understood in the same manner across uh, all panels. Um, and just before going into the synergy, so you know that we have the individual grant schemes, and these grant schemes um, they can run up to 2.5 million plus 1 million, some extra cost that I will go into a bit of detail there too. So these, these are all targeting individual PIs that have to dedicate a certain amount of their work um, uh, during the five maximum five years of their project. And they can be on different career stages. Now in the synergy grants, two, three or four principal investigators can apply and they can be of any career stage. Now, that, that being said, we see that the majority of the applicants have a more senior, more advanced grants um, profile, but everyone is really welcome to apply. And these grants are of 10 million and they run up to six years. And in four different cases, they can, applicants can ask for up to 4 million extra. Not it can be asked for single PR or that it can be asked for the whole grants for four PIs. It doesn't matter. They are, for example, for um, special um, access to infrastructures or um, very big equipment, for example. Um, and the other interesting uh, feature of the synergy grants is that one of the PIs can apply with a host institution that is outside of European Union or an associated country. Why I'm saying that is that, for example, Switzerland or United Kingdom, they are not an associated country anymore, neither EU nor, nor associated country. Nevertheless, you as a PI can join forces with another PI from these countries, provided that uh, the corresponding PI is in within the EU or associated countries. In all these cases, all each of the PIs have to spend minimum 30% of their time, working time on the project and 50% of their time in Europe. Now, of course, if a, if a non-EU um, PI joins, they do not have to, to come to work 50% of their time in the EU. Now, where is Belgium? So I will just show you a couple of slides to see in the past um, um, almost 13 years, how Belgium fares and quite in a quite good situation, I would say. You can see here that in total until 2021, you have 424 individual grants. That's not counting the synergy grants. And the majority of these grants, they go to young investigators because as always the, the ERC Scientific Council, they put around two thirds of the money for young to promote young investigators. And then only about one third of the whole ERC budget, yearly budget goes to either advanced grants or synergy grants applicants. This gives you an interesting picture of where from which country, not which country, what are the nationals that have um, a, a Belgian um, grant where whether they are native uh, Belgians or they come from uh, abroad. 
it's interesting just to see the comparison with different countries. For example, you can see in Italy that the, the vast majority of the applicants, they are nationals, they are Italian nationals, only very, very few of them come from abroad. And on the other hand, almost as many uh, Italians as stay in Italy are working abroad. They get an ERC grant, but they are not at home. So the Belgians, if you compare, for example, with that, then you can see that the majority of Belgian ERC grantees are Belgian nationals. Quite a good number. Uh, you, you are capable of hosting quite a good number of um, non-Belgian researchers that wish to, to do their ERC grant in Belgium. And you have a small fraction as well that uh, of Belgians that do their ERC grants abroad. It's, just, it's always interesting to compare different countries. For example, look at the UK as well, that half of the, of the UK grants, in fact, they are non-UK people. It shows an attractiveness of the country as well for foreigners. You can see, for example, Israel, that almost all of the people who are doing ERC, who have ERC grants in Israel are in fact Israeli nationals and only very few of them, they work elsewhere. Now, what about the Synergy Grants? So this is the latest picture of the Synergy Grants. We had the last call, completed call in 2020. And in that case, we had, I think, 22 applications involving uh, Belgian host institutions, and none of them were successful. The success rate was very low. It's only about 7.5%. You can see that even France or Germany, they, they have, for example, grants in which they have 19 host institutions, for example, France um, and Synergy grants, but their number of applications is absolutely very, very big. So this is not that bad as you would, we would think because there are really a lot of almost 30, 40 other countries that didn't, or the submitted a grant proposal, they didn't get anything. However, you were quite successful in the 2019 and 2018 applications. And I'm, I'm very happy then to see uh, one of the PEIs uh, here um, involved in the relevance project and talking about how she got the grant. And also I'm very glad to hear that the panel member is here also to explain how um, the grant evaluation went. So I will just speak broadly about the, the features of a Synergy Grant and how you should prepare an application. I will touch upon the evaluation criteria, how the evaluation process goes, because that's quite peculiar, then try to give some hints and tips, and then some just a proposals overview. So we will have 300 million euros, which means about 30 grants to be funded with a grant scheme that will open for submission on the 13th of July, probably. Never goes, the submission system is never perfect. We might have a bit of delay in how actually that works. I hope not very much, but the idea is that starting on 13th July, at least all the guidance documents will be on the funding and tenders portal for you to apply. And the call deadline will be 8th of November. And as I said, the PIs can come from any country and the host institution have to be in EU or associate country with the possibility of having one PI based outside. I receive often this question, whether it's, it's more advantageous that the PIs are in the same institution or different ones or different countries. There's absolutely no requirement on that. It is just the best combination of the PIs, the best complementary expertise that is needed for the project that is looked at. So they can come from the same corridor or they can come from distant countries. It doesn't really matter. So at, at its core, it's that usually PIs have a very ambitious research problem that can be tackled only through the joint effort of the PI. So it's a grant type where you have to show that it is not possible to achieve that scheme, that, that idea with a single PI. If you could do that, then, it, then the other individual schemes are for you. This is only because you do not have the expertise because it's really cross fertilizing different um, areas that is so ambitious that there's no way that you and your team alone should tackle it. That's why the synergetic aspects are very important. They are a means to achieve it. It's not the end goal. It's not a buzzword just to have a synergy uh, proposal. 
this know-how of the group, the combination of the scientific approaches, it's really very important to achieve um, the, 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 the aims. So all the PIs are equal, they are named in the grant agreement. There is more a burden of being a corresponding PI because they really that's the administrative role, is the administrative contact point, both during submission and during reporting and any other contact with the PIs usually goes through the corresponding PI. And I mentioned or, already, it's that it's very much welcome that different uh, career stages, young people with more senior people do come together and uh, tackle this problem. Strong commitment. It means that it is really expected that a PI is part of the group throughout the six years. If a PI falls out, this project will be reevaluated. So you cannot just change parts of it. The PIs are at the core, each of the PIs. So synergy aspects, I've mentioned already, major scientific question. So maybe it's interesting more to see what is not synergy. So I think the reviewers, they do not want to see a very loose cooperation, not a loose um, networking between the PIs. It's, it's not just any other research um, big project funded by the EU, but it's a very, very close-knit group. And therefore, this simple passing of data, um, that's not really the aim of, of a synergy grant. And an important aspect is that it's not necessary to be interdisciplinary. It doesn't have to cover very different or distant fields. However, even if it's within one field, for example, theoretical fields with, together with experimental parts, it, it shows, it has to show that just the, the one part of it, it's not enough to do the, to the objectives of the grant. Now about the proposal structure. So you have your idea, then uh, how to submit. So there are two parts of it. If one is the administrative forms and the second part are the B1 and B2 parts. These are research, the, the research parts. One is a short one, only five pages, and it's only evaluated in step one. While in step two and three, part B1 and B together, so the extended uh, scientific proposal of 15 pages evalu are evaluated together. So part B1 is the one that contains these five pages of synopsis and the curriculum vitae and the track record of each of the PIs. While the methodology, the resources, they are evaluated only later one, they are part of B2. The administrative FAR forms and the annexes, you also have to understand that it's only looked at by the ERC staff, that the reviewers, they do not see that. So they don't see the commitment of the host institution that you have to have at the time when you're applying, each of the PIs have to have it. They don't see the ethics document either. You do not need to, to provide PhD documents, for example, for the synergy grants, because we don't have any formal requirement on that. However, you need to select very carefully and to write very carefully your abstracts and keywords, because all proposals, they arrive in one uh, panel, and these keywords are very helpful, and the abstracts as well, in assigning the right reviewers um, to the proposals at the very initial stage when all the proposals are in one panel. All this is described quite in detail in the information for applicants document that will be there in, in July when you will try to update. So I would really advise that this is the first thing that you are checking when you are wanting to apply. There is one novelty compared to, to the past. It's that uh, the scientific uh, council, they subscribe to the DORA principles. Therefore, the journal impact factor is not looked at anymore during evaluation. And we are inviting reviewers not to do that and really to look at, at what the quality of the publications and, and what exactly um, are uh, put in those publications. It's also a possibility now that the principal investigators to provide a short narrative description of the scientific importance of their research outputs. That's not an obligation, but we see that more and more principal investigators in the 2022 call, they have this in, in their grant application. It helps also the reviewers assess the whole 
track record CV of the applicants in a different context as well. Of course, in, in case of COVID, um, if you had a career break, um, then you are invited to describe that in the proposal and that will be taken into account. There's a gender equality plan. You as a PI, you are not concerned nevertheless, but you will have to tick this box on, in the application process and note that your institution has to have a gender equality plan at the granting stage. So when you sign the grant agreement, but I think most of the institutions know that because in all the other Horizon Europe um, grant uh, schemes, you all, they already, this is a requirement. It's only that now in Synergy it is introduced. This is about the submission restrictions. This is always for the past. So if you apply in 20 or 22, or you apply to different other uh, ERC calls that whether you can apply to this poll or not. But if you're thinking for the future, whether you will be able to apply then just bear that in mind that if you will receive in Synergy a very low score, a C score in step one, then you will not be able to apply for the upcoming two calls in the Synergy grant. So you have to skip two calls and you can apply only to the third call. And in 2023, the other novelty is that those applicants who receive a CT score, they will no longer be restricted from applying to the advanced grants because until now that was the case that, as, uh, that a person who, any PI who got a C score in Synergy at step one, they were not able to apply neither to the Synergy nor to the advanced grants and that will not be the case anymore. So the only restriction here is the tough one is if you receive a C, then you are excluded from Synergy for the upcoming two years. The other thing to note is that if you are a grant holder, an individual grant holder now, if there is never a possibility, by the way, to have at the same time two main running grants in the ERC. So one has to finish for the other one to start. But even to apply, you have to have this requirement of the current grant ending within two years of the submission deadline, which would be 8 November 2025. So if you are a grantee now, and you want to apply to Synergy, so check when your grant ends to, to know whether you can apply. We receive a lot of other questions um, from applicants, whether they can apply to the starting grant or Synergy grant or consolidator and Synergy grant and so on. So when you want, when you're thinking whether you want to apply to an individual or to a Synergy grant or any other call, you have to check the call year in the call name, in the call title, like SIG 2023 because this is not a calendar year, it is the work program year. And the work program year, it always comes out in July in the case of the ERC. So it means that, for example, if you somebody applied to the advanced grant 22 call and they want to apply to the Synergy 23 call, they can do that. In that case, if you will have questions, I can answer what happens, but basically that's not an eligibility problem. You cannot apply to Advanced Grants 23 and Synergy 23 or Advanced Grants 23 starting Grants 23. So be just careful at the title, um, at, the, at the year in the call title. Evaluation criteria, as in, other ERC, in any other ERC grant, the only criterion is the quality of your proposal, the scientific excellence, and the quality of the principal investigators. And that is a test, of course, a different level with different questions. I'm not reading out the questions because you will receive the slides. But why I'm putting that here is that this is one of the, the things that I'm always advising applicants to look at. So when you are looking at the information for applicants or work program, then check out what these questions are because the reviewers, they have in front of them these questions and they are seeking for a reply. They're looking for a reply in your proposal to these questions. So make sure that they can find those answers in your proposals and watch out what are the questions for, for the part B1. And then what are the questions when the reviewers look at both part B1 and part B2? For example, these are the ones that come up in addition, in step two, besides the previous questions, you will have these additional questions that the reviewers will look in, into it only when they have, uh, they have access to part B2. 
So these were on the scientific part, and now on the principal investigators, you have these three questions that the reviewers can um, answer. And in addition, they have also a comment box where they can have general comments on the PIs, on the group of PIs. So the group as a whole is, invest is assessed. You do, they don't have the reviewers, they don't have for individual PIs these separate questions, but as a group, as a whole. About the evaluation process. So just to put it in context again, so in the normal grant teams, you have 27 different thematic panels. You have, for example, 11 in the physical sciences engineering. In social sciences and humanities, there are seven panels. So in total, you have 27 panels. And then in each panel, you have reviewers. In each panel, you have a set of keywords. Now in Synergy Grants, it's not like that. At the start, there is only one panel. So we imagine that all proposals in all subject areas, starting from astrophysics to history to languages to any sort of biology that you can think of, they all come into one uh, panel. So at that moment, we have a set of, of reviewers. They, in step one, they are generalists. They are only about eight, seven, and they are supposed to review everything. So it's quite difficult to do that. Therefore, we are making use of so-called panel evaluators. These are panel members of other regular ERC calls. So they are helping in quite massively in step one to review the proposals. So these reviewers, they all work remotely. In general, every proposal receives four to five reviews in step one. Then there is a meeting. At the meeting, only 11 people participate. Uh, five panel chairs and six vice chairs, they score the proposals. And what you need to know is that about seven times of the call budget uh, will pass to the next step. So no matter what, we know the budget for uh, 2023, we know that 300 million, we know what is the average budget, which means that about maximum 230 proposals can pass. Of course, a lot less can pass as well. It depends on the quality of the proposals. And then that's when the applicants will receive a B or a C score. And as I said, the C is the one that is quite punishing score. As soon as we have these about 200 proposals that are passed to the step two, then the chairs, um, then they form five panels. These five panels are not fixed ones. Again, they are just matched to best match the reviewers with the proposals that are still in competition. But roughly, broadly, there are two physical sciences engineering, two life sciences, and one panel that covers everything in social sciences and humanities. At this time, part B1 and B2 is looked at. And I said, you still have only about 87 panel members. They can still act as generalists. There will be a few proposals which we, to which they can act as specialists, but the, to the most of them, they are not. Therefore, they are using they are using unpaid reviewers. These are called remote referees. So the panel members, when you, they look at your proposal, then they think who else in the world, no matter where, can review your proposal. So we make sure that every proposal besides these panel member reviewers, they receive a good number of external specialist reviewers. So about nine, 10 reviews per proposal. Then we go into the panel meeting and at that panel meeting, the panel members come to Brussels and the panel members again score proposals. They discuss every proposal and then they decide until now it was only about a maximum three times the, the call budget. Now it is about four times the, the budget, um, which means about 100, 110 proposals will pass to the interview stage. And then again, in step three, it's a possibility to keep the same five uh, uh, panels or if um, there are different combinations of what, what remained in the competition, we can reform the, the five panels. And in that case, there are no reviews written anymore, but the panel members, they prepare for the interviews, they for formulate questions based on the step two reviews and based on the panel discussion they had in step two. So when the PI comes, they present for 10, 15 minutes, then they use these questions uh, to start asking questions. These are not exclusive. They are not the only questions, of course, they can ask during the, the interview, but it's a very thorough 
preparation from the panel members entering into this interview section. So uh, I pointed out that all PIs have to be present and they have to be physically present in Brussels. So we will have, for example, the 22 call we will have in the first week of September, we will have the interviews. You see here the dates for all the panel meetings for the 23 uh, call basically. So who are evaluating proposals? You can see the scientific background of the panel. This is the 2020 evaluators profiles. Of course, I cannot give you the profiles of the 22 uh, panel members and take good note that even if you know who's evaluating now in 2022 and you're an applicant, don't ever contact them because if you do that, you will be excluded from evaluation. If you have any questions about the evaluation, you're welcome to write to the Synergy Applicants mailbox and we can answer, but never ever contact any reviewer. And then besides these panel members and reviewers, you can see, as I mentioned, that we have a huge amount of remote referees because we have a lot of reviews for each proposal. And you can see that only about the one third of them actually deliver a review. That's nothing new. This is very similar to every other ERC call. We are inviting, we are contacting a huge number of reviewers that only about one third of them deliver. We even tried it out in the past that we paid them, for example. It didn't work out. The acceptance rate was not bigger, but it was a much bigger administrative hassle. So that's where we are. So now I'm giving you some hints and tips. Um, step one, panel members who are generalists, so they only look at part B1. So they will be looking at this groundbreaking nature, the know-how of the group, and make sure that it's a very concise and very clear presentation that is understandable to people that are not close to your subject area. If you have, if you are quite young, starting or consolidated profile, then make sure that you are using that sort of track record, that sort of CV, you choose which CV goes with, with your profile and that you are demonstrating somehow your scientific independence. Now in step two, so both the short and both the long ones are, um, the long proposal is looked at it. So don't just copy paste, don't just repeat plainly what is in part B1. However, expand it, provide sufficient detail on the methodology, on the resources, on the work plan and so on with whom you will work, the involvement of the team members, also a lot, they are looking into high risk, high gain aspects. So then provide these strategies on how you mitigate the risk, the scientific risk in your proposal. As an applicant, you should always ask why you, are you alone good enough for an ERC grant? Then if not, or yes, then why this group, how this group comes together, how competitive they are, how strong your group as a whole is to tackle that question. And on the research project, then how is this project important? Why, uh, how can it go substantially beyond the state of the art? So again, these, all these things, please think a bit about it in your project. Does it have a chance to cross fertilize disciplines? I'm, I'm just saying these because all this transformative potential, this cross fertilize, it's in the work program. This is what the reviewers look for. How grand the challenge is? Why are you the best combination or the only persons to carry that out? Is the other person better only as a team member? So it's a very small part of the project or it really is needed on as a PI. So that run that question several times. How timely is your idea? Why it was not done in the past? How feasible it is now? And again, how risky it is? What is the gain? What happens if you don't make it? And then in step three, then the budget, of course, there are no cuts across the um, across the panel, so they will not cut just simply the proposals to fit one more proposal in. However, please think about explaining your cost. You're applying for 10 million or, or sometimes even 14 million. You will be managing a very substantial grant, so you should know quite well what your budget, what are you requesting on? Then you will have quite a lot of freedom during your grants lifetime to readjust it to, of course, the science might not go as you predicted it, 
nevertheless, you have to know it quite well. And then if we are looking at the reasons for rejection of, of the ERC grants and of course for the Synergy grants is then we, we see different aspects. So there are on two levels, one of the principal investigators, then it's again that they don't believe that that PI is good enough to carry out that research, that the complementarity of the group is not good enough. Why these groups? Nothing special about them. So these skills, knowledge, experience, expertise, disciplines, methods, how these have come together, that's quite critical. Um, and then the project, whether it's too narrow or too broad or too unfocused, it's not clearly written, not synergetic enough. Again, this know-how is not there. Incremental research is quite often, so it's interesting, they say, but maybe not really a step change. And because it's a very competitive call, you really need a, 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 a step change. And of course, then the interview. The interview can completely change the orders as well. So that one we have seen for the successful applicants that they prepared quite a lot in advance. They had mock interviews um, before that. So summing up, a joint effort, you have to have the research project, think in time to have the host institution support letter, look at the evaluation criteria, view advising always to get feedback, a lot of feedback from your peers, and what we have also learned from successful grantees when visiting their project is that this, the how, if it's really very distant subjects that come together, then this obstacle of a different scientific languages, uh, it's not the same um, uh, in biology or in, in chemistry or even in physics, um, for example, what a catalyst is, it doesn't work exactly. They don't mean the same things. So, this building up of how very different things will together, it's not only for reviewers is a challenge, but it's a challenge also for you when you're putting your proposal together. And the other one may, it seem may silly that you should submit your research proposal before the deadline, but if you're seeing that many, many applicants, about half of them, they're actually submitting right before the deadline, a couple of minutes or in the last hours, and that could be a problem because nevertheless, you know, with the different combinations of the, of the PIs and team members and administrative contacts in the, in the forms, you should never try that on the last day. You have to upload a lot of documents too. So at any moment you can overwrite your um, application and always the last version is in evaluation. So make sure that you have a working version with all the administrative data in time before the deadline of five o'clock, 8 November 23, 22, sorry. So just to tell you, because we are all, always also receiving these questions, whether they, uh, what scientific fields are covered, everything. As you can see, social sciences are as successful as any other proposals uh, in, in different uh, panels. So we are receiving, these are the keywords that the applicants put forward in their proposals and the green ones are the ones that are actually um, on main list. So they were the funded proposals. I think we have only one case where we don't have in the 2020 call an LS4 keyword. But besides that, we are covering a huge amount of, of um, scientific fields. So summing, really I think the last one we had a 7.5 success rate we will have an 8.4 for this call that is now in evaluation and we don't know what will be of course it will depend on how many people will submit for the 23 and if you are a younger stage applicant we are encouraging you very much to apply check out the work program. We have videos on how to apply um, on, on different things, how to consider applying, how to fill in the applications. And you have four videos on running Synergy grants. So have a look at them to get a feeling about that. And of course, you have your well-functioning entities that can help you. And it's always there, the Synergy applicants mailbox. So you're most welcome to, to contact uh, us because we are replying to to that mailbox. So my team and I always reply to your questions. Thank you for your attention.